Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Elizabeth Braw, and uh, I'm looking a bit funny because I'm, I'm sitting in a public space, so I will shortly put on my face mask so I don't, uh, I'm not reprimanded, but uh, I'm uh, delighted that this event can finally take place. We scheduled it for March, and then, lo and behold, a sudden virus struck, now it's about to strike again, so now it's a perfect time to, to have it, and in the meantime, our two speakers have had a couple of changes, one got married and one got promoted, so what better time to, to have this uh, event and congratulate them. Uh, and uh, the two speakers are, of course, uh, Major Ilse Leimane and uh, Gunnar Gavrilko, who are the, they wouldn't want me to say the key personalities, but uh, two of the key personalities in, in creating and implementing Latvia's really innovative national security curriculum. There is nothing like it anywhere else. And I think that the point of having allies, of being allies, is that we can learn from one another. And I think there's a great deal that other, other countries can learn from Latvia, even if they, if they, uh, they wouldn't be, um, if they wouldn't be uh, able to implement the curriculum there that we are about here, but if they weren't able to implement it uh, full scale, then at least draw inspiration from it, because it's clear to everybody that uh, we need to involve younger people in national security. Some countries have national service. That doesn't work for all countries. By the way, you're hearing uh, airport announcements in the background, because I've just been in Italy learning about how the Carabinieri include uh, business leaders in their contingency planning. So uh, from there on to how to include uh, teenagers in uh, national security, I think, is, is a very, uh, very apt uh, combination. So the way we'll do this is that we have, uh, as we had quite a few um, attendees sign up, we have a combination of um, of uh, people listening and people who are able to, to speak uh, when they want to ask questions. So if, um, if you see yourself being able to mute and unmute yourself and have your camera on and off, that means that you're able to, to ask questions in person. If you don't have that, you're able to type questions in the Q&A function. Um, so, uh, and if, if you're one of the people on video, then uh, if you can just indicate to me on the chat function that you'd like, like to ask a question, that would be fantastic. And so, uh, Ilse, uh, Guna and I will, will start with a brief conversation about the program and then we'll move on to discussion. And uh, so we'll start with, with Guna, who uh, is uh, the, the civilian part of this duo, as you may see from, see from their outfits and, and have, of course, seen uh, on the invitations as well. So Guna, can you tell us a little bit about how this program or this curriculum came about? What was the impetus? What, did the impetus come from Parliament, from the... Uh, uh, from, uh, from the Ministry of Defense or from somewhere else? Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, well, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for organizing this event. And uh, I'm really glad that you have uh, shown interest about the subject. This, uh, we're also uh, just evaluating the project and, and uh, doing some changes uh, occasionally. So I'm glad to, to be talking to you today here and uh, discuss this matter. But going back to your uh, question about uh, how it all started, actually, uh, it brings me back to um, some long time ago, because uh, already in 2006, when uh, Latvia abolished uh, military conscription, um, MOD has always uh, looked for the options how to broadly involve the society into the defense debate, defense uh, questions. Uh, however, the final deal breaker, the game changer, was only year 2014, after the military conflict in Crimea and the occupation of Crimea is uh, when we finally got the support from the government and also from the society to, um, to talk about these questions and to, and to finally explain how uh, this important, uh, how important this is. So the main goal of the Minister of Defense has always been to you know, to build a resilient and prepared society that uh, not only can defend the country, but most importantly, that is willing to defend the country if it is needed. And so in order to do that effectively, you have to talk with a 
large, um, large amount of, of, of people. And uh, you have to talk with younger generations because they are the ones that are building and gonna build in the future uh, this country. So um, yeah, we realized that uh, the key element is the education, is education is where we have to start and where we have to involve them in this debate. So um, um, actually in the beginning, the decision was built to the program for teenagers uh, during the grade uh, 10 and 11 as a um, voluntary uh, project. And so um, why exactly grades 10 and 11 is that those are the teenager years when the person's character is being built. And it's when one is shaping its values, uh, how um, he or she will you know, live throughout um, the life. So that was the right time to explain the younger generations and teenagers that it is your responsibility to um, defend the country if needed and, and to also have skills uh, and, and, and be prepared in terms of um, shaping the society in the way that you never actually get to the military conflict and, and you actually build um, the society that um, is uh, deterrent itself. So um, we build the program, we build the, the content of it with the components that I, I will probably explain in detail later. But um, so we brought this to the parliament's defense committee and uh, we explained that this is the curriculum that we could, uh, we could uh, incorporate in the national secondary education curriculum and offer to the schools voluntarily and then provide this knowledge to those that are interested in these subjects. But the deputies actually were really um, excited and interested in the topics that we presented. And actually less than half a year later, they brought it to the um, parliament uh, SAIM uh, that we have to all deputies and presented this idea. And already in, in 2018, uh, we got the vote from the parliament uh, that actually said that this is not going to be a voluntary voluntary thing that but this is going to be a part of national secondary curriculum as a mandatory subject starting with year 2024. Uh, which was actually kind of a surprise for us because that mean that meant that we have a lot of homework to do. We have to, you know, get our infrastructure ready. We need to also um, find the uh, and 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 mili the, mil the military personnel that will do it is what was the was the biggest challenge of of you know to make the plan how we will get so many people that will be these instructors and cover all schools of Latvia with this uh, subject. And um, why also everybody liked this idea in the parliament was that, uh, you know, traditionally military conscription uh, is a concern only for uh, men. But here in this case, with this uh, type of curriculum, we are able to involve both boys and girls. And obviously, if you, once it's gonna be a mandatory subject, it's gonna involve all the 10th graders, all the 11th graders, which you know allow us to gradually um, increase the amount of, of uh, the, the, the prepared uh, part of the society, uh, part of the society that is um, you know, politically active, involved in their community lives. And uh, yeah, and I have no doubts that they will have this feeling about that uh, Latvia is uh, worth to uh, defend, that they want to defend it, and they also will know how to defend it if uh, there is ever a need. Thank you. And, and I think that's, that's the, the key question in many countries. How do you, how do you create that willingness to defend the country? And uh, it's, uh, national service has been the tool that has been used by every country, at some, almost every country at some point in their history. But as you said, it's, it's not always the best answer today because we, uh, 
well, some countries need that, that body of, of uh, uh, personnel, but most countries do not, especially since, since warfare is changing. And, and, and I think uh, Latvia rightly decided that, that um, mandatory military service is not the right answer. And so I, I want to ask, what are the, well, first of all, what are the key components uh, of the curriculum of what did you set out to achieve in building the curriculum and what are the, the goals that, that you want to achieve once uh, a certain number of, of uh, well, a few uh, cohorts of teenagers have uh, done the curriculum? Yeah, so the uh, long-term analysis that was uh, done in terms of how to deal with the uh, modern military conflict, how to deal with the um, 21st century uh, warfare obviously involved a, a lot of a lot of uh, different skills that need to be taught uh, to the person. So we um, divided that in a couple of uh, blocks. And uh, so the first one um, was the uh, civic engagement block, that's how we call it, where we also involved our uh, local NGOs uh, in, uh, in, in, how, in, in producing uh, this knowledge. And this is, this is the block where um, we talk to teenagers about how important it is to uh, be a uh, civic, uh, it to, be, yeah, to be engaged in, in, in uh, their local communities how important it is to have a political participation, um, how important it is to, you know, to participate in the elections. And uh, in Latvia, we definitely can say that we have a deficit in civic engagement and, and in this uh, political participation. So that was one of the, the basic, um, basic lines, how we, how we wanted to build this. We also, in this block, we talk about the corruption and how it damages the democracy and the values of the democracy. And uh, yeah, and, and also in this block, uh, teenagers debate and they, they discuss, they develop analytical skills about a lot of historical events that uh, have shaped Latvia and, and also different, uh, different historical heroes uh, that are important of, of why this country is independent today and, and how to, how to how to also uh, manage to be this way in the future as well. And the uh, next block uh, where we build knowledge is crisis management and resilience. Uh, this block talks about uh, the preparedness, about the comprehensive defense system. As I said, the, the responsibility of everyone in the country to uh, act and to be actively involved in defending the country. Uh, it talks about uh, also things like resistance movements and international laws. And also uh, in this block, we're trying to raise and promote uh, leadership elements uh, like public speech training and uh, different activities uh, like that. And then, um, and of course, uh, the, the last big block, uh, how the, the program is, uh, uh, is divided is uh, state defense skills, where we uh, teach a lot of uh, probably to say military activities. Uh, and we're teaching, for example, learning how to use um, different communications. Uh, it's also uh, the orientation skills, you know, working with uh, maps, how to orientate yourself, um, you know, out in, in, in the field. Uh, it also teaches the first aid elements and also uh, for sure safety and use of uh, pneumatic uh, weapons and uh, therefore building uh, these very, very basic um, military skills. But then two elements that goes throughout all these blocks is definitely physical fitness. Is that where we uh, engage them, we take them outside and most of these the, these lectures are not happening in the classroom. Uh, majority of them are outside. You take them out in the field and even you have the you know, public speech 
uh, lecture you you may do it outside and so the physical fitness is, is is a crucial element here and another crucial element that goes throughout any of these blocks that I just listed is a critical thinking element as I said it's being developed through uh, analyzing different events in the history or or any other uh, discussions, debates about democracy and, and, and also the civic engagement, the civic patriotisms, critical thinking and physical fitness then go out throughout any of these, uh, of these blocks. So this is the core of, of the curriculum. Thank you, Guna. Now, uh, Major Neymana Ilza, uh, is uh, a key person in the implementation in her role uh, within the National Cadet Force. And so uh, I would be keen to hear from you, uh, <laughs> well, Lisa, how it has, uh, what the curriculum looks like in practical terms. In, in other words, what happens during the lessons that are being taught. And we should, uh, I should add that uh, the curriculum, curriculum has been introduced at is being rolled out at, at schools uh, gradually. So not all schools have it yet, but uh, a growing number of schools are implementing it. And um, I think in the year 2024, is that right, is that all schools will be teaching it. But can you give us a sense of what the curriculum looks like on a, or what the lessons look like, look like on, a, on a daily basis? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. So, um, those state defense lessons are once in a month for one entire day. It takes seven to eight hours for pupils. And um, lessons can be provided inside classes and some of them can be provided outside the classrooms. So in, in the area which is next to schools. And um, Composition is following principle, a half, one half of this day is more theoretical lessons and one half of this day is more active trainings. Um, so um, teachers are our cadet force instructors. They have military experience um, and they, um, they have been studied uh, pedagogy. So that's very important to, to teach this curriculum. Um, yes, about this um, schools, we have, um, we started with 13 schools and now we have uh, 67, which is uh, approximately 10% of total uh, secondary schools in, in, in Latvia. So, um, it's um, the results we're getting, we have uh, like better than we expected. Um, we have got uh, feedbacks from, um, from schools, from instructors um, to get the results, what is uh, going on um, in a positive manner and what should we change. So regularly, we have those feedback meetings. Um, after the, for example, after 10th grade year, we provide a summer camp, which is summer boot camp for those pupils which participated during a year. So, but this is also a voluntary, this summer camp is a voluntary activity and the main task for those boot camps is to provide more, um, more trainings, which is not possible in those classrooms. So that happens in the area of uh, military training areas. And, and there is a good area and there is much more time for to practice activities. Um, about... Um, Summer camps also um, the pupil which participate in uh, first summer camp after grade 10, they uh, develop individual military skills, but these pupils which participate in the boot camp after 11th grade, 
they, they develop um, collective skills like section level skills. And that's how we um, gain this um, evaluation. Ev evalu yes. And um, this summer camp is for 10 days. Paid for by the government, yes? Yes. Yeah, so free of charge. And it's interesting, you told me earlier, Ilse, that uh, um, you have a high level of participation in those summer camps, even though they are voluntary and that uh, a large uh, percentage of the participants are, are girls, which is something that might surprise people, if, uh, even though I, I don't think it should surprise anybody, but uh, can you just uh, uh, give us some, some uh, quick facts on who participates? Participating in uh, boot camps, yes? Yeah. Yes, uh, um, we have the, in those hell camps participate uh, boys and girls. And uh, yes, the girls, it's for, uh, like 40 to 50 percent from this total uh, members of, on the summer camp. And they, um, girls can do the same activities as uh, boys and they they don't like, uh, they, they don't uh, show any negative attitude on what we ask them to do. They are willing to participate in, ev in every activities. And again, that illustrates uh, a point that I've been trying to make, which is if you ask teenagers to, uh, to be, or if you, if, if you invite them to be involved in, in, in some aspect of national security, uh, ranging from resilience to, to more advanced skills, they will seize that opportunity. They are not snowflakes. It's just in most countries, there are no opportunities for them to participate and to be involved other than joining the armed forces, which is not for everybody. Uh, so is um, uh, another quick question for you. And then I see there are a lot of questions coming in um, that I will uh, uh, turn to those people for. But can you just give us a, um, an idea of the results so far um, from this, these first couple of years of, of testing the equipment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the results I can uh, split in four parts. Uh, one is uh, this uh, content analysis. We have analyzed, uh, an, an, analyzed uh, what we should change. Uh, for example, some timings for lessons, some uh, to make uh, under, more understandable some lessons for teenagers. Then second part is um, that we have uh, build up partnership with non-governmental organizations. Members of those organizations came to this curriculum lessons and to, to, to give their experience of civic uh, activities. And this uh, experience changing procedures is very positive as for student um, pupils and for our instructors as well. Then a third one uh, part uh, for the results is um, very crucial um, because it is a cooperation between um, our ministry, our um, cadet forces, then uh, Ministry of Education and Science and uh, schools administration. All those four components uh, should cooperate very closely together. Schools have a lot of questions how to really Im implement this curriculum inside their already um, educational system. So uh, Ministry of Education and Science should answer on their, their questions. And also we are asked to answer on different questions and we have to be on the one um, equal level to um, understand all things equally. And the fourth, a part of results is, of course, um, pupils, uh, teenagers, um, they gave us a feedback that they are positive about this curriculum. They like to, in, to be involved. They like even more practical activities. They ask for them to let's go outside, let's do more military things, or even uh, also they like to discuss actually about um, um, 
democracy. They like to discuss about uh, civic activities and part, uh, participation within society and, and municipality. They like both activities and uh, discussing and analyzing all those um, state and individual uh, um, relationships. So. Thank you very much. Now, there are a number of questions already. So, uh, since uh, quite a few are uh, on the uh, with, with panelists uh, 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 opportunities, I will uh, give you uh, the order in which your questions came in. And then, if you could be so kind to uh, unmute and then mute yourselves. So, we'll start with Ambassador Keith Shannon. Um, which, uh, who is uh, the British ambassador uh, to Latvia, then um, he will be followed by Lord Harris, uh, Madeleine Moon MP, and then I would also like to bring in Peter Lunak, Deputy Head of Engagement at NATO, and uh, then I'll return with, <laughs> with, with more names. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you to Guna and to Major Limani for your, your, your presentations. Um, sitting here in Latvia, uh, I mean, this feels very real, obviously, um, as part of uh, Latvia's general approach to societal resilience. And I think there is a lot that uh, many other countries could, could take from this. Uh, maybe not the whole programme, but certainly parts of it. Uh, and we're certainly very interested and supportive of some of the work around critical thinking and um, uh, countering disinformation. Um, a question came to me when, when you were speaking, Guna, that I, I haven't really thought about before, but perhaps I should, which is about the resourcing of this. Could, could you expand on how this programme is financed? Is it from the education budget, the defence budget, uh, and does it contribute to your 2% target? Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Ambassador. Um, yes, so it, it's financed fully 100% from the Ministry of Defense budget. And um, since um, it, it's both for the um, instructor salaries, instru infrastructure, and also the equipment that is needed in order to conduct this uh, subject. And uh, yes, indeed, it applies to 2% uh, of uh, and goes into the 2% uh, of defense budget, because we also obviously are looking at this as a potential for our recruitment uh, targets. And so, you know, if we attract and naturally raise the interest of the, of the young generation, about different um, activities that we have once they turn 18, you know, we have Zemestards and National Guard, we have uh, reserve soldier uh, training, and obviously active duty service. So, you know, we are arguing that in order to have a positive recruitment numbers, you have to explain and raise awareness about that during the, already this, uh, this school age. And therefore, it will allow later uh, to attract uh, young uh, people to the um, army goals as well. So this is how we look at it. And that's why it also um, falls under 2% uh, of uh, 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 GDP uh, to defense budget. Thank you. Over to you, Toby. Uh, thank you very much. It's been fascinating, really interesting, and I can understand the importance of focusing, particularly for some of the programme you've described, on years 10 and 11. But my question is that attitudes, um, behaviours are determined much earlier in, uh, in life. Uh, for example, we educate very small children about road safety. There is an increasing expectation that we will educate really quite small children about internet security or personal internet security. Um, and uh, therefore, should we not be starting to educate about national security and personal resilience at a much earlier stage, integrated into all sorts of parts of the uh, curriculum? Um, and that obviously looks at both natural um, general security 
personal resilience, what you do in the event of a crisis, but also that critical thinking you talked about, uh, because fake news and uh, strange things arriving on the internet is going to be experienced by children of um, uh, much earlier than years, years um, uh, 10 and 11. Yeah. Thank you, Elizabeth. Before I ask my question, I just want to say, Elizabeth, how much Rusi and we in British Defence, the debt we owe to you for putting together events such as this. And we're going to miss you so much when you leave. And you've been such an asset and such a good friend to us all. This is a great, sad event in one sense, but also your crowning glory because you've been the one pushing this throughout your time at Rusi. And thank you very much. And it's thanks to you. It's even got the, the small amount of give that it's getting in Britain at the moment, so thank you. When I was president of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, in every visit that I made, I insisted that I got into a school, a college, and talk to young people. I never ever found any resistance from the young people. They were desperate to ask questions, desperate to understand, and really engaged. The reluctance tended to come from the military. And a prime example was in my own constituency of Bridgend, by the way, I'm no longer an MP, um, where I had the RAF demonstration team come and I had 111 year olds, Toby, you'll be pleased to know, in the audience. And the, the RAF were not keen on this at all. They said, oh, it's too complicated and too frightening. They gave their, their presentation and a hundred hands went up. And the first question was, is Russia a real threat? And the second question was, what's the RAF like as a career opportunity for women? Their questions were sophisticated and nuanced. So my question is, how do you actually, how did you get the MOD and the education departments, which in the UK is are just opposite ends of the spectrum, to begin to talk to each other? Though I do say telling education that 100% of the budget will come from defence is a good start. And how do you get that political buy-in in somewhere like the UK where we don't have the very clear threat just over the border? Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. If, if I can come in, thank you so much for um, for that very generous comment. Uh, it has been a, a huge privilege and as uh, to 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 um, to lead this project. And and uh, thank you so much, Madeline, and, and many others for your support. And uh, it's uh, thanks to to. Uh, people like you that it has been able to, to gain uh, the impact that uh, it's having now. And I should also um, mention to anybody who may not know it, which is probably almost everybody on this call, that today is my last day at Rusi. Uh, tomorrow I take up a new position, but I will continue this work and, and build on, on uh, what I've done so far. So um, it's uh, uh, the idea. So, are coming with me and uh, and so are I hope um, uh, your ideas which I hope to, to build on and I should also thank the Minister of Defence of Latvia for having been one of the very first organizations to to see the potential of uh, of this program and to join not just in uh, in interest but also in, sort of in um, uh, supporting the program and as we all know without um, without such support, there, there wouldn't be any think tank activity. But uh, with this short interlude, I'll, I'll let uh, Guna and uh, Ilse answer uh, Lord Harris's question and Madeline Moon's question. Maybe I can uh, start uh, this question the, the, that uh, more in, in, in about the young guys who should be taught previously already about some uh, attitudes and, and some uh, um, civic uh, these um, attitudes uh, I would say that um, I'm, I'm from cadet forces so uh, our cadet forces main task is to uh, to work with younger guys from years 10 10 age 
and and we provide them um, uh, this kind of um, education as a voluntary education. This is not like uh, in those schools, but this is like um, voluntary interests education. They can join us and uh, we're working with them, starting from uh, patriotic activities, uh, participating in uh, municipality when it is, for example, our state's uh, uh, university, uh, uni uh, like uh, states, uh, especially days, and then following on with uh, military skills from the elementary uh, elements till uh, very um, specific elements. That's, I can um, explain about this um, question. did you want to come in on yeah i i, I can i can uh, add on on uh, both of them and, and starting first with uh, the question regarding the earlier ages just as uh, ilza also explained just right now and i i feel like that this such curriculum in senior uh, school years was like kind of the missing piece because for sure already in the primary level and in the basic education level they do have subjects that talk about security about the you know the long independence path that Latvia has done uh, over the 101 years, but so there is this gradual development and and yeah in primary element in the elementary school we can talk about you know uh, don't uh, play with fire um, you know when and when when mom and dad is not there or or you know don't cross the street at the red light so you have to build this kind of knowledge gradually starting with uh, with human security elements and then you move on with uh, there in the curriculum currently in latvia there is a um you know history of latvia which was specifically talks about what has happened to the country in terms of you know our our fight for independence our fight for freedom and you know you build the 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 mind of teenager gradually and then in the final the, the senior school years you can specifically talk about the military and defense things because you know that's where it starts and that's that's where it ends and specifically also because we have these basic military activities uh, it's a sensitive topic and you know going in the earlier ages is is not really uh, there's no actually even a need so it's more important that you know children um, get their knowledge starting with the very own basic individual security and then he moves on with um, the knowledge how to defend the country uh, if it is needed so so that's that's how it's uh, we uh, we see it but absolutely you're absolutely right that these topics have to you know it starts with the family um, parents have to talk with the kids and their families about um, how it is um, how important it is to be you know politically in, uh, involved and and to show the example of going to elections and that's how children will for sure um, take those habits uh, for themselves as well. So it's a definitely a mix and combination of these processes. But senior school years, as we see as a very defining moment specifically for defense and security related issues. And commenting on um, the cooperation between education and defense ministries is, yeah, exactly. And I think that the biggest help uh, for, for us, the biggest support here was that we first went to the parliament. And as I said, we got such a unanimous support uh, from the opposition parties and coalition parties. So many people like this idea that, you know, once the politicians vote for it, it's, it's you can't as a ministry say, no, we're not going to do it. So I'm going to be honest saying that there was a political pressure on this matter, but we have had a absolutely great cooperation with the Ministry of Education. They have helped us a lot. We have not been able to do this uh, alone. And it's it's it also showed the very great cooperation between different uh, state agencies uh, in order to get this product uh, uh, done. We actually just uh, right now, I think it's already published or will be published in the next coming days, the, the full um, uh, program of the curriculum uh, with the, you know, very um, 
detailed descriptions, 50 pages long, that, uh, that was written together with the Ministry of Education so that uh, we can ensure that uh, it's easy for teachers. You know, we're not, we have not been in schools before, so we needed to also understand the nuances and aspects of, of uh, how, how teachers see it. So definitely uh, very good cooperation uh, was there, but definitely this political pressure in the beginning was the decisive moment for that. Thank you very much, uh, Guna. So I had um, mentioned uh, Peter Lunak from NATO next, and after that, uh, Hugh Strawn, Professor Strawn, um, uh, leading British military historian. Uh, so you first, Peter. First of all, in support of the argument that you have to start with uh, this kind of education early in the age. Um, in fact, you know, if you look at the public opinion poll, at least those that we conducted or commissioned, you really see that the uh, that the older generations have much better awareness of of and you know our our poll was very, uh, was really about NATO mainly, but the the awareness is much greater with uh, with uh, uh, older generations. Uh, in fact, uh, the difference is. This is again the, the 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 picture across the board. Uh, I'm not saying that is the same in, in in Latvia or in Estonia or in my country, the Czech Republic, as it is in Germany, for example. But across the board, if you look at it, it's really it really uh, shows that the younger generation, you know, those who didn't uh, live to see the the Cold War, had much lower awareness. So I think you know it's very important to start that at the at the young age. The second thing is, and and again, you know, I would like to. Um, basically follow up on what Madeline Moon said, who was very helpful and instrumental in, uh, in raising all these issues within the, uh, North, uh, with the NATO Parliamentary Assembly when she was a member of it. Because in fact, NATO Parliamentary Assembly had a, a working group on, on, on education, which was precisely you know, looking into how this kind of very good initiatives could be made available and, and, and used as lessons learned for, for others. In fact, you know, we in NATO Public Diplomacy Division worked closely with the NATO Parliamentary, uh, Parliamentary Assembly. But the problem always was that we, you know, we found out something that is obvious, but we didn't really know how, how, to, how to go about it. Or, you know, that basically the education system in every single country is so different that uh, you cannot have one size fits all. Um, that, uh, for example, what would work in, in, in Latvia, you know, uh, would not necessarily work in, in Germany. I, for example, in my own country, the problem always was that, uh, that the, the, the school establishments uh, were not necessarily excited about actually having that kind of program because they said, look, you know, we have so little time to do what we are supposed to do by the, by the curriculum that is actually compulsory, that we have no time to spare on, on, on uh, national security, which, is, which I think is a mistake, which is, which is a rather short-sighted uh, short view. So my, um, uh, and if I understand it correctly, this is, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the program that we have been discussing uh, so far and it's really fascinating, is, uh, is on a voluntary basis. It's not part of the curriculum, uh, of a high school uh, curriculum, um, which, which I think um, is applicable to some countries where there's a general willingness to actually uh, uh, do more about it. But, but I'm just wondering how to do it in, in, in countries or what, what could be useful for countries who, uh, where there is, you know, the context is, is, slightly, is slightly different. So um, uh, uh, my question would be really what in, 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 in view of the organizers of those who are behind this uh, program uh, could be useful or how to approach it uh, in, in, other, in other contexts? Thank you, over. Uh, can we take uh, Professor Strawn as well and then uh, take the answers from, from Bruno and Jensen? Thanks very much. Um, I, I have a seri series of questions, but I'll try to keep them very brief if I can. The, the first is just to clarify in my mind that there is now essentially a, a through education system in Latvia. I mean, from primary to secondary on the grounds that you do cadet corps, admittedly voluntary at primary school, and then your national security education at secondary school. I just want to be clear in my mind, I've got that right. Um, 
the other specific questions are, uh, it's interesting that you made so much reference to the possible positive impact of this on recruitment. Um, and um, of course, you make the point that Latvia has not returned to conscription, uh, but of course your Scandic and Baltic neighbors either never went away from it or have restored it. So my question is, is around that area, um, you know, is the debate alive? How will you, will this affect the debate? Um, is it definitely a substitute or is it a way into some sort of uh, replacement? Um, and the, the, the third question I've got is around resilience and, and self-evidently Latvian society is, is uh, particularly for us in, in Britain, the model of, of you know, resilient society um, and uh, with a great sense of awareness of its own security and the needs for it. But one of the points I would argue in the United Kingdom has been that COVID had um, a direct effect uh, on a public awareness of resilience in its place. And I just wonder whether you've seen uh, an impact from COVID-19 in Latvia, from, um, from COVID-19 within Latvia, in terms of an appreciation or even a different appreciation of resilience. You talked about links between human security and national security. Have, have those two come uh, if you like, even more aligned as a consequence. Thanks very much. So four questions there for you uh, and, and Ilse. So I'll, I'll let you split them however you like. I don't know if Gunnar, would you like to go first? Yeah, I can, I can go on and then uh, probably we have uh, some other questions. So yeah, answering uh, on the, the the first question, I mean, yeah, it's very difficult for me to say uh, what other countries um, could could use from our experience. And as I'm saying, we are still in the beginning of this road, and uh, hopefully, we can be uh, a, a a this uh, the you know the people that bring this idea further uh, in other countries because I really believe that education is the piece for any process that you want to change and uh, considering the fact that uh, um, pretty much all um, like-minded countries have the same security challenges and issues then uh, talking and involving uh, young generations is uh, it's difficult for me to come up with an example where it is wrong or bad idea and, uh, and actually, that uh, brings me to the answer of uh, second question about um, uh, is the debate alive about the um, military conscription is um, what I mentioned already before is that uh, currently we see that we need uh, much uh, larger involvement of society in the defense matters than military military conscription can ever give us. Uh, you know that our, our population is small, our resources are very limited, and uh, we will never be able to do a mass conscription in the 21st century uh, again. It's, it's just the economy is not gonna be able to, to bring it on. Therefore, currently the debate is not a lot. There is uh, actually no support for military conscription in Latvia. And uh, we do public surveys every year. And uh, with every year, starting with uh, uh, 2018, we have very uh, good attitudes towards this uh, national defense course. And what is important is both from Latvian speaking, uh, society and also from Russian speaking minorities, we have very good numbers uh, that are saying that they support this uh, program. Uh, and so, and as I said, uh, this program involves both boys and girls and, and military conscription tends to be um, traditionally only towards um, men related, uh, uh, men related. And therefore we think that this is a mo modern approach uh, to the uh, modern challenges and that, um, yeah, we can't really conscript uh, 30,000 people that now we will be now able to
reach via this course. So we think this will, uh, and I hope that uh, future will uh, prove that I'm right, but this, this uh, as of now, we see that it is more effective because uh, the program is, uh, is popular. And already now we have around 15% of Latvian schools voluntarily join this. And we just last week had the meeting with the, with the teachers, uh, with the directors of schools that have our program. And they say that uh, uh, they have uh, pupils that have actually even come from other schools in their uh, districts because that school doesn't have national defense course and we have so this is how they have uh, attracted uh, new pupils because the reputation have uh, started uh, to be really good and while educating uh, them on the on this matter uh, therefore we hope that also recruitment numbers will be uh, will be higher because, as I said, we have different programs that we have established. We have National Guard, which is uh, military trainings uh, during the weekends and, and summer months, and uh, people are getting involved into that uh, uh, very actively. Then we have uh, Reserve Force training, which is also uh, to involve voluntary persons that want to do a one month uh, military bootcamp training once in four years. And, uh, and therefore, you know, uh, to increase the amount of people that uh, have done uh, military training, uh, even though they have not joined the army in an active duty way, um, in a full time sense. So yeah, so currently, we, we think that this natural rays of interest about defense matters works better than forcing them to come in and, and, and serve because, uh, as I said, we will never be able to conscript thousands of, uh, of uh, people. And that means that, you know, selecting only a couple, uh, couple uh, hundreds will, will uh, do more harm than uh, effectiveness. Oh, and sorry, and there was an, uh, another on COVID-19 impact. And actually, uh, I must say that uh, since, the, since national defense course is a part of wider comprehensive defense system that we're introducing in the country, then uh, even though you know the pandemic is really a bad thing for us, it has been a um, actually some sort of window of opportunity because this has allowed us to prove to the society that crises do happen and that you have to be prepared for uh, different sort of scenarios that may happen to us. And, and this could, to, to be honest, it has been a very timely um, reminder to the society that this is the world we live in and, and not only military crisis can happen, but this sort of a crisis can happen. And, and for example, here in Latvia, once the state of emergency was declared, then we had people overcrowding the grocery stores, buying um, lots of water, lots of uh, buckwheat and uh, toilet paper and uh, preparing themselves to barricade for a lot of weeks and to you know, protect themselves uh, from uh, coronavirus. So, for us, it has been actually uh, uh, the opportunity to to say that hey, you know, we're talking about this for a really long time. Uh, things like these can can happen, and uh, climate change is happening. So definitely, we will have challenges in that sense as well. So the comprehensive defense system has just proven to be um, very, very, um, you know, actual, and 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 that this is needed. Thank you, Gwyneth. We have time for just a couple more questions. I'll let Daniel Sommer come in, come in. And I also have a question here from, uh, from another participant. So I'll read this one and then uh, Daniel, it's your turn. And if we can keep it all pretty brief because we're, we only have six minutes left. Uh, here's the question. How does Latvia aim to balance the tensions between delivering a mandatory military skills program in schools with the obligations under the UN conventions of the rights rights of the child, uh, in particular the optional pro protocol on the involvement of children in armed conflict. And over to you, Daniel, if you could keep it uh, pretty brief, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
I would like to know how was uh, this program uh, received socially and if there was um, any opposition and if so, uh, by whom? Then um, you mentioned those uh, summer boot camps. Uh, I would like to know uh, the social background of the attendees. Um, and, um, and also um, uh, you mentioned that uh, roughly 10% of uh, high schools in Latvia are participating in this program. And I would like to know if they're from mostly uh, urban or rural areas. Um, and that's all, thank you. Um, I may try to answer on these uh, last questions. Um, most uh, actually to participate in this our curriculum, there are a lot of schools from countrysides. They show the biggest uh, interest in this in the beginning. And so they are uh, the beginners and the pilot uh, uh, involving those members which uh, participate, yes, they, they show bigger interest. Uh, um, little more, we have uh, bigger schools, like, um, and this is, I agree to uh, one question which, uh, which asked that, uh, yes, this curriculum takes uh, more time for those uh, pupils. Yeah, that, that's, the, um, that's true, but uh, so the schools anyway, have um, voluntary um, methods to how to implement our curriculum in their um, planning, um, educational uh, education plans. So it is possible. Uh, about summer camps, um, is if I understand correctly the question, uh, so uh, we have um, different uh, members. We have boys and girls, we have boys and girls uh, as for, from the city schools and from country schools. And we don't separate any, um, anything uh, in, in, in the view of point of social um, backgrounds. It is uh, completely voluntary. And if we have a space in this summer camp uh, to participate, we are very uh, open to that uh, they, they participate. Una, did you want to come in on, on any of that? Yeah, as uh, I will then answer the, the first question about the United Nations uh, uh, Convention of the Rights of the Child. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, obviously we we have this question. We, we get this uh, question a lot from other um, other countries, but uh, yeah, for us it's 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 absolutely different what the the breed, uh, of what the uh, protocol has forbid because. Under uh, year, under age 18, we never use or give them uh, actually a, a real weapon. It's not the case. They do not get real guns. They are using a small caliber or a pneumatic uh, weapons, which is also like the, the type that is used in the games like laser tag or, or paintball or, or uh, activities like that. And the other, these military uh, skills, as I said, traditionally, or here we put them under military block, but traditionally those are uh, very basic uh, and uh, very uh, popular things like orientation uh, with the orientation in the, in the forest and how to work with the compass and with the maps and, and first aid also falls under the military block. So absolutely that's not the case that uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, making uh, uh, this teenager uh, a, a combatant and, and it, therefore this is not uh, we do not teach them a real military infantry uh, training, which would be the breach of the United Nations protocol. Thank you, Guna. With the, the hour almost upon us, I'd like to invite Latvia's new ambassador to London to, to online. There she is, uh, Ambassador Burmistre. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Elizabeth. And uh, I would like to start by uh, thanking uh, everyone who uh, contributed to today's discussion and uh, to both uh, panelists uh, for a very uh, comprehensive 
uh, presentation and uh, a very uh, rich uh, discussion. Uh, Elizabeth, as uh, this is your last uh, day uh, of, of work um, here, I would like uh, to take the opportunity uh, to say a few words uh, of uh, gratitude uh, to you, um, Elizabeth. Uh, I would like to thank you uh, on behalf of my predecessor, uh, Baiba Braja, and myself, uh, as well as on behalf of uh, Ministry of uh, Defense of Latvia for uh, the close cooperation uh, we have had. Uh, we have been uh, glad to support your work on the modern deterrence uh, project. Uh, it has uh, considerably uh, facilitated the understanding of the modern security environment, its dynamics and transformation, and uh, has made significant contribution to our uh, joint security uh, issues. Uh, we really hope uh, that this wo uh, work will be carried um, on as it is definitely uh, worth it. Uh, dear Elizabeth, uh, as you embark on your uh, new professional adventures uh, on the other uh, side of the Atlantic, uh, we wish you all the success and uh, new achievements. And um, I am uh, confident that your uh, friendship and cooperation with Latvians will continue at any location. Thank you very much uh, and uh, good luck. Thank you very much, Ambassador. It has been a, a pleasure. And uh, I know I'll, I'll stay in touch with, with Latvia. And uh, thank you again to the Latvian MOD for its support uh, throughout uh, the, the, uh, the life of, of uh, this program. And I'd also like to, to thank our other supporters, um, Camilla's House Watson, Clifford Chance, um, Fraser Nash Consultancy, uh, Zurich, uh, the Minister of Defense of Lithuania, NATO, and the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. And um, as I mentioned, without uh, such support, there would be no think tank activity. So, so thank you to all of those organizations, and especially to, to uh, Latvia. And it's I'm, I'm pleased to be to be ending my Rusi tenure with, with this event. So. Uh, well done, Natya, for being so innovative when it comes to national security. And uh, we'll, we'll be watching your future success. And uh, to all of you who participated today, uh, thank you very much for participating. And um, I'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.